On today's episode, we are joined by Bassmaster Opens Angler and co-host of Bass Talk Live, Matt Pangrak. This is a fun one. Matt and I chat about his journey through the Bassmaster Opens, the future of tournament fishing and the fishing industry as a whole, his journey through the years at Bass Talk Live, and a ton more coming at you on this episode of Tackle Talk. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. Welcome to the Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Tackle Talk Podcast. As you heard in the intro, we have Matt Pangrat coming up in a little bit, and it's going to be a really cool conversation, down-to-earth, laid-back, talking about a whole bunch of different things. But before we get to that, your ears did not deceive you. If you listen to the intro, we have a brand-new intro, and we have a brand-new title sponsor of the Tackle Talk podcast. It is the boys over at American Legacy Fishing. So you guys have kind of got familiar with them a little bit because they're helping us with the Dobbins discount that we're running right now. But it's going so well, and we've got so much good feedback that we want to go ahead and announce this now that American Legacy Fishing is coming on as the title sponsor of the Tackle Talk podcast, and I could not be more excited because this is a company that I've ordered through years and years ago and continue to still order from, and it's one of those things that I just thought was such a good fit because of what they specialize in. They specialize in two things, and you heard them in the intro, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service, two things that kind of make them special. First, world-class fishing gear. That's kind of a given here. They have great stuff. They carry G. Loomis. They carry Dobbins, Shimano, uh, Daiwa, all your big name stuff, right? American Legacy Fishing is going to carry. And again, it's really cool because they carry a bunch of different brands, which lets us kind of stay unbiased on this show. So that's what I'm you know, super excited about is, again, giving us the chance to continue to do what we're doing. They're being very supportive. They're gonna, not going to change this show at all. They're just going to give us resources to help us make it better. So it's going to be really, really cool. So that's the first part, world-class fishing gear. They have that box checked. I can attest to that because I bought a ton of stuff through them. And then on the other side, unmatched personal service. You don't have to take my word from that. You guys have found that out firsthand by ordering these Dobbins rods with our discount. They were kind enough to help us out with the Dobbins discount that I've wanted to get for you guys forever, and we are finally able to make it happen. And you guys are seeing firsthand the experience that you're getting from American Legacy Fishing if you buy something through them. So they are from Evansville, Indiana, an awesome locally owned Midwestern company that you know just has those Midwestern values, those Midwestern roots that make means taking care of your people from start to finish, from the time that you check out to the time that your order is processed, it's shipped, it's on the way, it's delivered, and checking in afterwards. That's what you get with somebody like this. Uh, everybody over there is just fantastic. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. Here's one of probably the 20 or 30 messages that I've got over the past week of people just kind of you know telling me their experience after they had a chance to order their Dobbins rods. So this is just a completely random message. It says, hey, Andrew, I just wanted to say you are a 1,000% correct about American Legacy Fishing. I just ordered a rod last night, the Dobbins Fury 7.3 medium heavy, and I forgot to put in the discount code. I called them, I had an actual person pick up the phone and help me find my order and get the promo code applied and answer some additional questions. Never been more satisfied with a fishing company ever. That's what you're getting with American Legacy Fishing, and that's why I'm pumped to partner with them. So go check them out, www.americanlegacyfishing.com. They have a whole bunch of different stuff you guys can check out over there. And again, not just great gear, but great service too. So again, go check them out, www.americanlegacyfishing.com. All right, let's get into our episode here today. We have Matt Pangrak with us, the other half of Bass Talk Live. A couple months ago, I think it was probably at this point, we had Mark Jeffries on, who is, uh, I guess, one of two of the co-hosts of Bass Talk Live, and Matt Pangrak is the other one. So we're going to hear both sides of this. This is really cool. If you've never listened to Bass Talk Live before, I definitely encourage you to go check it out. It's one of those shows that's been around forever, 17 years, I think, is is this year for them. So again, some folks have just kind of pioneered a little bit in terms of fishing radio and you know covering tournament angling like an actual sport. Mark is an OG when it comes to that, and Matt has been right alongside him. So they are a great duo. It's an interesting, we'll talk about it 
little bit, and we talked about it with Mark, too, back in the day. Um, but the interesting, I guess, kind of dynamic that they have, the two of them, that's what makes the show so cool. So we'll talk about that. Matt is also coming up through the Bassmaster Opens right now and trying to qualify for the Bassmaster Elite Series eventually. So we're talking about that, about the journey and the grind that it is of going out and fishing these Opens and how that kind of mental process works. So we talk about a lot of different stuff here. Really cool conversation. Again, Matt's just a down-to-earth great guy and makes for a fun conversation. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Just a very laid-back, fun episode of the Tackle Talk podcast. Here is our conversation with Matt Pangrak. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined today by tournament angler and co-host of Bass Talk Live, Mr. Matt Pangrak. Matt, thanks for joining us, man. Hey, thanks for having me. You have to you have to reverse that though. You have to go in order of how you make your money. So it's podcast <laughs> and then tournament angler. One Co-host of Bass money, Talk Live you, and yeah, Tournament Angler. <laughs> well, thanks for taking some time to talk with us. I know you're a busy dude, especially these days. Um, you've been grinding. First off, this past year for you, I have to imagine just a scheduling nightmare. You've been putting some hours on the truck. You've been traveling like crazy. You're still holding down your BTL duties. Uh, how are you holding up over this past year? Uh, it's good. Um, I'm fishing all nine of the Bassmaster Opens and then doing the BTL thing. I mean, let's be honest here. It's a podcast like four or five times a week. So it's, I mean, it's not like I'm like punching a a time clock and like just putting in hard manual labor. So, uh, I don't make it more than it is, but yeah, it's a lot of travel, a lot of logistics, uh, and a lot of money to, to try to make it happen. And then I put two dates wrong in the calendar. Uh, that I just realized yesterday. So I told I told Mark, the <laughs> co-host, I was like, hey, I, I won't be here Wednesday through Saturday. So then I call my other buddy. I'm like, hey, I'll be down there Wednesday night. And he's like, why are you coming four days early? And I was like, oh, so it doesn't start until Saturday? At least he told you before you start driving. Like, yeah. You yeah. Oh, I'd have been I'd have been down in Del Rio, <laughs> Texas with nowhere to stay in the middle of a border war on Wednesday. You're just down there fishing uh, yeah. random lakes and ponds and be like, well, I'm yeah. down here, so I guess I might well, as well. Well, no, down there, there's one lake. There ain't no other water oh. down there. It's like Amistad or nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then you run into like, I know you guys have all these uh, rules too about how long before tournaments and stuff like that that you can fish and, you know, the practice, mm-hmm. uh, things like that. Would that have... Would you have even been allowed to fish if you'd have gone down there? Yeah, no, I'm just doing this as a thing I do every year that I'm starting this next next week. It's called Kurt Dove's Pro Bass Camp, and Kurt Dove fishes the uh, MLF uh, Pro Circuit, and he he was a big basketball guy when he was younger, so he always remembered going to, like, elite basketball camp and how much he looked forward to it. So, like, I think eight or nine years ago, he was like, I want to start that same kind of an elite fishing camp for kids to look forward to every week during the summer. Um, And then he asked me, Uh, I've known Kurt for a long time to be one of the kind of instructors there. So, you know, you do seminars, the kids come in small class size, you know, like two anglers per instructor and they get to fish with three different guys and then have a little tournament at the end of the week, casting contest, dinner. They just get to eat, sleep and breathe fishing for a week during the summer. So kind of a cool thing that I try not to miss. How long did you say you've been doing that? I think seven. I think I've done, I think he's had it like nine years and I think I've done seven of them. Have there been anybody that you can remember, like from coming to that camp where you're like, okay, they went on to, you know, the college teams or something? And, and oh, yeah, well? a, a ton of them, like a, a bunch of those guys. Now, uh, there's a couple kids that were in the camp that have, are fishing Costas or that are Costas out, that would date me there, that are fishing the Toyota series and <laughs> opens and moved on to uh, on. Um, actually, there's a kid who's going to be back as a counselor. His name's Brady this year, and he, he fishes for Auburn now, guys who are winning uh, collegiate tournaments. So it's really cool. Cool. You can kind of tell, like every year, there's a couple of kids who are like, "This this kid's got it." Really? Yeah, that's cool. Well, and then uh, in full disclosure too, so we're not a super heavy uh, tournament podcast, and you know, we'll mm-hmm. talk about the the results and we'll go over some stuff like big takeaways from tournaments, but we don't really spend a ton of time on it. Um, and I know, uh, I think you're in a really cool spot in your career where you're right in the middle of obviously you're chasing this dream and you're in the opens right now. And I think a lot of people listening to this may or may not fully understand how because it gets confusing sometimes how oh, yeah. you you qualify for the elite series qualify for Bassmaster classics like these really uh prestigious things that we know and hear about all the time you have to qualify through doing what you're doing right now so can you explain to the listeners i guess how you go from where you are now to hopefully an elite series spot or a classic berth or both yeah it's kind of the wild wild west and for everybody in the fishing like <laughs> tournaments they're trying to make it there like some we're like there's got to be a like a better like eat like better way to do this because you go like like in any other sport uh i mean like in golf you have like you know pga professionals but then you have like 
I don't know what it's called now. I remember the Hooters tour it used to be yeah. called or whatever. Yeah, I don't know what it is now either, but I uh, do remember. The Corn Ferry tour. It's the Corn Ferry tour. Ah. And then you like can get your PGA tour card and you have all these different exemptions. But in fishing, uh, you obviously now you have two major organizations. You have MLF and you have Bass. Uh, uh, MLF has a very similar kind of qualifying s- process, but I'm fishing the Bass side. So in order to get to the elite series, which is the top hundred, which is what you see on FS one, which is where, you know, your Chris Aldanes and your Scott Canterbury's and Scott Martin's all those guys fish. You have to qualify through that process. And the only way to get there now is through the Bassmaster opens, uh, which is an $1,800 entry fee. They have three divisions, the East, the South and the North or the central, they change them every year. So the central, <laughs> the Eastern, no, the central, the Easterns and the Northerns. Yeah, that's what it is this year. And then they, you get points. So there's 225 to 240 guys in each tournament. Uh, each tournament ha- or each division has three tournaments in it. So there's four ways to make the elite series. You either finish in the top three in the points in the centrals, the top three in the points in the Southerns, the top three of the points in the Northerns, or you can also fish all nine of them, travel all around the country, and then they'll take the top three in the points overall. So it's based on a 200-point system, 200 points for first, 199th for second, and so on. And your goal is to make points throughout the year, and then you get invited to the Elite Series, and then they drop, I believe, the bottom 10 in the Elite Series every year and bring on 12 new Opens guys. So right now I'm in the Bassmaster Opens. The interesting thing about that, though, is you pay an $1,800 entry fee, and as long as you get in before you're on the waiting list, you're in. So there's yeah. no like qualifying process. They're not like, have you fished a tournament? Do you know how to run a boat? Do you know what a tournament is? Like you have the money and you can get in it. Now there's massive waiting lists and stuff for, for all three divisions now, but like if you can get in it, you can fish it. So technically, if you want to look at it that way, every single person on earth is six days away from being on the elite series, which is <laughs> crazy to think about when you think about it. That's wild. Yeah. Have you ever been put on the wait list? Uh, I, I was on the way. So like I said, there's all these little nuances. It used to be yeah. like you had to have a co-angler link and then get in and then yeah. they have sponsor exemptions and all sorts of stuff now. But because I, I fished last year and I finished high enough last year, I got like priority entry into this year. Uh, so I didn't have to worry about that this year. Got it. So I know, like you said, this wasn't your first year doing the opens. You fished mm-hmm. a couple last year, if I remember. And one of them you did really well. I, I should have looked this up, but you were like creeping top 10 on one of them, right? Yeah, I finished 11th, which really ticked me off because I wanted that Uh. little notch in the top 10 on the stats. But I fished (laughs) the Opens in in 2015, um, and it was just kind of like to get my feet wet to see what it was all about. I'd always had kind of like a five- or ten-year plan, and I I knew even in 15 um, that I was like three or four years behind that plan, so I fished it. I got freaking drilled, and every single one of them learned a lot, (laughs) and then fished the Bass Nation, which is kind of like the grassroots level. Uh, still have some avenues to get places like I, actually the top finishing Bass Nation guy gets on the Elite Series too, but uh, almost did that in 16 and 17, uh, finishing the top 10 in 2017 on Lake uh, Hartwell. The one that uh, Caleb Sumrall, who's on the Elite Series, ended up winning that yep. one and went on the Elite Series and then uh, fished two divisions of the Toyota Series in 2018 and then the Central Division of the Opens or 2019 then the central division of the opens in 2020. And now here we are 2021. So where was the one I'm thinking? Was it Neely? Neely Henry? Yeah. Neely Henry yeah. that I finished yeah. 11th and it's just a brutal, tough early fall spotted bass, little bitty crankbait, yeah. wacky worm stuff. It was like 10 pounds, 11 pounds a day. Like that's my jam. Did, did that give you a boost at all? At least of like, Hey, okay. 11th out of whatever it is, 200 something boats in an open. It's like, that's something 99% of us probably couldn't do. Like, was that kind of a, a, a boost to say like, okay, I'm, I'm maybe closer to just completely uh, going all in next year for this. Or do you think like no, you'd still I be mean, doing what you are this year if you it, didn't have a helped. good finish I, last year? At that point last year, like you kind of know, you kind of have a feel, um, I guess whether you belong and that's like in air quotes, like, yeah. There's a difference between like being out there and getting lost and you have to go through that, that learning curve. But I mean, if you have to, I mean, expect to compete and expect to do well. And like, yeah, I was, I was pleased with that finish, but only because it kept me alive in the, in the qualifying for the elite series with the points. Cause I still had one left and that jumped me up into the top 15 in the points, but you get to a level where it's not so like, look at who I beat. It's like, do you understand the fishery? How are you breaking it down? Like, how are you making decisions? And then 
my thing is if you just you just have to keep putting yourself in situations to succeed and as long as you're putting yourself in situations to succeed then you're growing as an angler and developing as an angler because i mean let's face it like the guy who's won the most out of all this kvd he wins less than like 12 percent of the time he's yep. won like the most out of everybody so that's that's almost like a 90 percent not winning or, or failure rate and fishing has an element of luck into it i mean it's not like uh Djokovic in tennis or a tiger in golf or, or, or any of those things. Like it's really hard to be consistently good here. So I kind of gauge success on putting yourself in position to succeed. You do that enough times and it's going to happen. Like, I I think you kind of start kind of questioning your ability and whether you're doing the right thing. If you're not finding yourself in those situations consistently. Do you think, do you think like success on having a couple tournaments of like in your, in your belt of like, okay, that went pretty well, gives you the confidence to, to go out and fish the way that you're comfortable fishing? Like I kind of picture this as like, I think Jacob Wheeler's doing this right now. I think mm-hmm. Jacob Wheeler's at the point where he's just kind of like, okay, I, a little bit of that pressure's off. If you can, con, you know, maintain some consistency and you can go out there and can fish the way that you want to fish, where if you're, you know, you ride the struggle bus for eight tournaments in a row, then you're running all over the lake. You're second guessing yourself. You're not, uh, I don't know. You don't have that confidence. You don't have that, that calm of like, okay, I can go out and do what I need to do. Yeah. I mean, look at the top guys in the world. Like Polinick talks about what's in between the ears all the time. KVD's motto. It's all about the attitude. Ike is fish the moment. It's not like their mottos aren't like cast better or (laughs) drive faster. It's like, it's like inerrant stuff that you can't like physically see. So a lot of success in tournament fishing is, I mean, if, if you want to call it a sport, you could have a whole nother podcast on whether it is or not, but it's like the only thing where you're like, you're literally on an Island with yourself for eight to 10 hours a day. Like there's a lot of time for weird stuff to run through your brain as far as self doubt, confidence, decision-making second guessing. So that part, and the more you do it, the more you do it, like as long as you're doing it right, I think the better you get at it or you just go completely crazy and broke and then end up, at the bowling alley. That's a good point. I can't, th- I'm trying to rack my brain. Any sport, true mm-hmm. sport that has such an element that's so far out of your control. Like, yeah. you know, if, if you're Steph Curry and you can drain something from half court 50% of the time, like that's all on you. That's the same mm-hmm. ball, the same hoop, same dimensions of the net, uh, you know, of the rim of everything. Like, it's not like you're doing that out in, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of it. If there's anything poker, like that, you know, what I'm talking about like stuff like that that just yeah, has a an full element, element luck, of luck element. Yeah, but you're still around other people. Like a lot of this time, like you know, either you're by yourself in practice for 12, 15 hour days, and then you have all this time to make decisions and then second guess it. So it's all what why so many of the guys talk about controlling the variables that you can control, yeah. and I think that's that's where I talk about putting yourself in position to succeed because you have to have some things go right. Like you cannot force a victory. Like that's why it's so impressive when it's like this guy should win. And then he goes out and wins like that to me, that's like more impressive than a guy coming out of nowhere and winning just because of how many things, you know, have to go right to be able to pick that guy who, you know, it goes right. And then he actually manifests it. It's a good point. Is there anywhere that you feel like when you look at an open schedule or you look at any schedule, is there anywhere that you feel uh, overly confident or more confident than others? No. So that's the thing also is the points are the points regardless of where the fishery is. So like if you're on the James river that we just got back from, it's a tidal fishery. i never fish a tidal fishery. It's got grass. I'm not great on grass. It's a river. I'm not huge on river. It's an East coast fishery as well. And it's got Florida strain largemouth in it. So that's like a O for five for me. But <laughs> when you're fishing for, for points to try to make the elite, it doesn't matter. Like I, yeah. I could be five for five and those could be all my favorite things, but a hundredth place finish is still a hundredth place finish. So you have to kind of, the way I, I, at least I do is you, you have to kind of put everything on an even keel. So like, am I more excited about fall tournaments with spotted bass on lakes? that might be drawdown that is rock and gravel and docks and a tougher bite yeah because that's like my jam but i have to be i have to approach that the same way that you do the james river with hey i'm shooting for a top 40 finish 
So you mentioned the James River. So this year you've had four opens. Correct. Uh, yeah. I think so far that you guys have fished. You started out at the Harris Chain. And I wanted to to ask your opinion on this because I looked up. Uh, I, I knew pretty much where you'd finished on all four. We're mm-hmm. pretty close. But I looked it up and there's kind of an interesting pattern there where obviously first event, Harris Chain, 111th place. Second place, Douglas or second event, Douglas, 64th place. Third at Pickwick, 48th. And then at the James River that you just hinted at, forty third. So you're yep. you're climbing every time. You're going the right direction. Is there anything, uh, you know, mental to that, or anything that you can attribute that to, or is it just kind of luck? I'll be honest. That's a hundred percent luck. Because if you yeah. go back and you, as far as getting better in each one, because if you go back and look at the weights, uh, Florida was completely stacked. You have a five pounder there, and I finished sixty fifth, fiftieth. Uh, Douglas, I was like just over a pound from cashing a check. There were like 20 spots separated by six ounces. Now, whether I have three ounces or eight ounces more, like, I mean, how do you do, you know, that's yeah. when it gets to that now, yeah, I did lose one there that would have helped. And then the same thing at Pickwick, I was six ounces away from a check. The weights were stacked and I was six ounces away at the James river and they were stacked. So yeah, it's gotten progressively better, but it's just been three really solid tournaments. The last three for me. And I've just gotten the lower, like I've drawn the short stick in my opinion on, on all of those. Like if you're the guy who finishes in 35th, you look at 45th and you're like, well, yeah, I kicked that guy's butt. He finished 10 places below me. But if you finish in 45th, you look at 35th and you're like, oh, we tied. He just got lucky with the bigger fish. (laughs) So it's like six, one way, half dozen, (laughs) the other, you know what I mean? Do you feel like you've improved at all from Harris to now? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think if you ask anybody who fishes, even if it's, they've done it for 30 years, they improve from tournament to tournament. These guys like never stop learning. That's why the top guys like this, they talk about fishing. Then they go, cause they're always trying to get better. Always. It's, so for me, I don't know how like nerdy you want to get on this, but fishing, like not tournament fishing, but fishing in general is it's like a circle, right? So you start at the top of the circle and you know, nothing. And then like, <laughs> total, like you kind of get down and you're like, Oh, I know, I know a little bit of something. I, I think I've, I've maybe laid this out once or twice before, but it's like real easy to get through that. Like first quarter of the circle. And then like, boom, you pick up momentum. And then you're down at the, you're like, I freaking know everything about fishing. Like, Oh yeah, I know how to do that. This is that I've got it figured out. But then as you start trying to climb up that other side of the circle is when you start realizing like, the more you know, the less you know. And I think it's yeah. like that in any discipline because you can never master it, but any discipline that you try to, you're trying to become the, the best that you can. I think the more you get into it and the more you learn, the more you realize how much more there is to learn. Yeah. And your standards change too along that circle. Like obviously when you're first starting out and you're like, you're going out and you're getting skunked and then, you know, you're catching one to two bass every yeah. time you're going out, you're like, okay, I'm figuring this out. Like I'm, I'm kind of hot stuff here. And then all of a sudden yeah. you get to the point where, you know, a four or five bass day is not uh noteworthy anymore. Mm-hmm. And like, we just had it. We just went out yesterday on a local lake and got our butts whooped. <laughs> and I came back and I, I texted my buddy and said, I don't know if I know how to fish. Like I, it's just one of those days where you second guess everything that you know, and you're like, I know where they should have been. I know what they should have been eating. I know where they should have been staged, and just nothing was happening. I was like, I don't, I don't know anything. Like I, <laughs> but you still you, probably like you talked about. It's that second yeah. half of that circle. I still, you probably learned some. I just like the guys. Yeah. Like you know, the the elite seals will be at the Sabine River. Like twelve pounds will be leading it, and there'll be a guy on there who's like, well, hell, I went out to my local lake and I had twenty five pounds today. If I had that money, I'd be a pro too. It's like you have to understand like the. <laughs> the circumstances and how it is, but like, yeah, once you start trying to climb and learn, like you're, you realize how little you actually know about it. And it's not just fishing. I mean, it's in in any discipline that you try to become a lead in. Okay. So you mentioned, uh, being nerdy about it a little bit here. How do you attack an an event that's upcoming? So like, say, I know like later this summer, you guys have like Lake Oneida, uh, Mm -hmm. you're going there in a little bit. What do you do? What's your timeline look like when you see that event on the schedule until it's time to to blast off at day one? Like, how are you attacking that information wise? How are you planning, you know, out your trips? How are you attacking practice? All that kind of stuff. So for me, I'm a visual learner, like prepared. So I like to I like to be able to kind of picture in my head what it's like. Well, fortunately I've covered elite series at Oneida. I fun fished Oneida. I've done some media events at, at Oneida. I kind of have a feel, you know, I've been, a, I've been around and I understand how it lays out and I know how the grass looks. I know about the shoals and the shoal markers and all that. It's one of the reasons why I struggle through the James river. You can look at it on Google earth and YouTube all you want, but until you see it in person, 
you're like imagining something. And sometimes you get on and you're like, oh, this is exactly like I pictured it. And other times you get on the water, like this looks like the freaking surface of the moon to me. And it's just, you have to, (laughs) you're you're like expectations and everything you plan have to match like what your eyeballs see and what you're able to interpret. So for Oneida, like I I already kind of know, I I, I know what I'm expecting there. I'm already like, you know, it's not until the end of uh, July, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, typically like what type of stuff that's going to be. So you're kind of already paying attention to what's going on there. I think their season like just opened up there or something too. Like in, I I mean, it's not like open 24, seven, three sixty five for bass. So you're going to start seeing more tournaments. You're going to start seeing, are there algae blooms or water temps? How's it fishing? What are the weights like? Is it predominantly small mouth, predominantly large mouth, any other major events there? Talk to some guys who are around there, what they expect, and then just kind of formulating a a loose game plan. And then kind of, so like, I don't have to have a top 10 there. I don't have to win that event. There's five of these events left. I'm in 15th overall. Uh, but I have to, if I want to stay alive in the Northerns, I need a top 30, a top 20 finish. So now I'm not just looking for a 12 pound limit. Now I'm trying to figure out how to kind of gain it. And this early in the season two with 111th under your belt, you have to start thinking like you have to kind of, it's not like a, balls out deal where it's like, I'm either going to smash them or nothing. Like I'm the type of guy, like I'll, I'll develop a safety plan in my opinion, like kind of a fallback to save my butt if things don't go exactly as planned or just fish that safety pattern and make the best out of it and get out and and get out of there with the 30 or 40th. Got it. It's just different for every guy. Like the guy I room with Bradley Hallman, he's like, dude, I'm putting a big stick in my hands. I'm fishing for large mouth. (laughs) And if I get five bites, I'm in the top 10. If not, I'll try next year. And it's just like, dude, I can't, I don't function like that. Like I like to be in it as long as I possibly can. And there's drawbacks to that. And there's also benefits to it. So. Is there any point where you get to, uh, to a point in a tournament where you just say everything that I've thought through going in this, I'm throwing out the window and I'm just going and fishing my strengths. Oh dude. So Louisville last year, most important tournament of my life to that point. I'm 14th in the points in the central division. I know a top 15 in that tournament and there's 160 guys in it. I'm pretty much locked for the Bassmaster elite series. And I practice for four days. I do everything. The lake isn't fishing that great. And I've had like three or four bites a day, max some days, like one or two, I just got nothing going. And I run into Kevin Ledoux, who's also fishing the tournament. Kevin's one of the greatest guys. He fished the Bassmaster Elite Series for a number of years. He's fishing two divisions. He's from Oklahoma. And uh, he's like, I run into him coming out of this creek. And I'm like, I got a bite or two in there. He's like, well, I'm going to run in this other creek. If you, I said, well, I was. I'm not going to go in there. He goes, I'll let you know if it's good. So he calls me the night before the tournament. And he's like, hey, dude, how you feeling? Is it horrible, man? I said, I don't think I can catch two or three. And I've been there five days. I got the Bassmaster Elite Series on the line. Like, I knew, decent bag, I'm on it. He goes, you want that Creek? And I was like, oh, I can't do it. He's like, dude, I'm a hundred and something in the points. He's like, I caught two. I shook three off. He's like, it's really sketchy to get into though. Um, but if you meet me in the morning, I'll just like, I'll just show you on your map, like where you can run. And he's like, avoid the stuff you can't see. And I'll put a mark where you need to sit down. Otherwise it's like kamikaze mission. So I said, okay. I said, I'm freaking in. And so I had never seen this river, never been up there, had finesse fish and tried to catch fish on riprap and marinas and all sorts of stuff for five days. And I put 25 pound test string on a flipping bait and run 25 miles up a Creek. I'd never seen a day in my life. And that's where I spent the entire tournament. And I finished 90th and I didn't catch him. I caught one fish on, but it was the right call because my co-angler caught three behind me was leading the dang tournament after day one. <laughs> yes. You're in the right <laughs> so, spot. <laughs> and Keith Poche was in there and he finished in the top 20 and Cody bird was in there and he finished in the top 20. So it just wasn't meant to be, but yeah, I threw everything out the window. I would have such a hard time doing that. Cause I'm such a guy that has to have a plan about everything. Like I, and I, and I would have a hard time second guessing all of the work and all of the, cause I would be, you know, like you were probably even a little bit more, I would absolutely nerd out and I would have everything planned to a T and I would study everything, be ready to go. And it would be so hard for me to throw everything out the window, but you're right. I mean, that's what separates the, 
the greats from the not greats because if you're too stubborn to to abandon that when you realize that something's not going right then you're just kind of shooting yeah, yourself in the foot unless it's a safety net like you're talking about where it's like okay i i've got an area where i know i can catch enough to keep myself mm-hmm. in whatever spot that i need to and i know i'm not going to win i'm not going to come out with the top five or a top 10 but i'll get a decent enough bag to keep myself in point standings which again is something that you have to think about that's where the guys who actually like kick butt in this sport are so good at doing they're so good at taking one little thing and then not letting like using their practice and their experience but not being a slave to it not like saying well just because i did this like a jordan lee a jacob wheeler a a polinick any of those guys will drop what they're doing and run with something because, I mean, in all reality, who cares if it was your pattern in practice? The goal is to catch as many fish, you know, the top five biggest or as many or weight, whatever format you're fishing in the tournament. And no one really right. cares what you did during practice. <laughs> it's you that's going, man, I put all this freaking time in on it. Now I'm not even doing it. Yeah. I know sitting here, I'd be like, yeah, you're right. I'd go run to the, you know, I'd run up the creek. I'd run 25 miles if I had a wild hair up my tail, but I know I wouldn't. I'd be too big of a pansy and I'd be like, no, I thought this through and I need I mean, to I don't know marina. if that was like being tough or if that was like just desperation. Eh, I'm yeah. not saying that it was a baller move. Like I said, I finished 92nd, so it obviously didn't work out, but I didn't say, I just still don't second guess if I could have a, to do all over again, I'd do the same dang thing. Really? So when you think of like your strengths, like something, I know you said maybe not necessarily like, you know, a, a certain body of water you get super excited for mm-hmm. or ready to go, but just, you know, certain techniques. Are there certain things that you like roll up to a lake and you're like, all right, this is in play. It's go time. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, if I can catch fish, either finesse fishing or on docks, that's kind of my jam. Um, I like doing a bunch of other stuff. Like, I I mean, I like flipping too, but I feel like I can really catch them. Like, like my favorite thing to do, which sounds really weird is either drop shotting or wacky worming docks, skipping a wacky worm around docks. And, but I'll do it. I do it on power fishing lakes. Right. So it's not like six pound test with a six, six light action rod. Like I use a seven, four medium heavy, like this last one at the James river, I caught all my fish on a drop shot with 14 pound and 16 pound test leader, you know, yeah. to braid. So it's like power fishing, but that's just, I feel like it's just my most effective and I've done it for so long. Like I believe if, if there's a fish on there that I can catch that. Um, other than, I mean, other than that, if I had to just pick two, those would be a drop, drop shot and a, and a wacky worm around man-made structure. Do you think that just comes from your roots and where you grew up? Absolutely not. My roots <laughs> no. growing up in central Illinois is like hope to catch three a day, start out throwing a buzz bait, and then throw a spinner bait or flip a black and blue jig. I really? don't know. I don't know where I came up with it. I have no idea. It's just like kind of evolved. It's not like Oklahoma. Like Oklahoma is like power fishing too, but there's a lot of finesse applications. Being a Midwestern dude, I guess I just stereotypically think of like all of us, like with a drop shot or a Ned rig or like, a, you know, a, a seven foot medium spinning rod and you just mm-hmm. go out and like, you know, that's uh, around here at least where it's really, really tough fishing. Like, yeah, you can go out and you can try and bust them on, you know, spinner baits or power fishing or stuff like that. But I mean, if, if you really, really know what you're doing and you want to look at the guys that are busting them around here, it's guys that just, you know, finesse all day long and they just have it dialed in that way. It's it's pressured hard catch fish around here so that's interesting so then in central illinois you were just you were just busting up power fishing huh no i power fished i didn't start this till i moved out to oklahoma and started fishing on my own and stuff i just like had an affinity for it just started like like it and i'm not saying i'm not like a brent Ayler or cody meyer over here like it's just <laughs> what i like to do it's like you asked me what my confidence yeah. stuff was that's my confidence stuff All right, we'll get back to our conversation with Matt in just a second, but first, a quick message from the boys over at Dark Horse Tackle. Dark Horse Tackle, you know them by now. There are some really cool Midwestern dudes that are doing some different stuff in the subscription box category when it comes to delivering baits to your door each and every month. There's a bunch of different boxes out there. A lot of them do the same thing. They're giving you those kind of off-brand baits, the baits that sit in the bargain bin for 10 years, right? I don't want an Arashi square bill for the 100th time in my subscription box. That's not what I'm paying for a subscription box for. 
caliber. Dark Horse Tackle, completely different. You're not getting those big name brands. You're not getting the brands that are, you know, nobody's buying and that's why they're throwing in these cheap boxes. You're getting locally kind of custom made gear from right here in the United States. So custom painted crankbaits, hand painted jigs, hand poured soft plastics, small tackle companies that are making cool, unique stuff right here in the United States. Small run, you know, not these big assembly line kind of things. I'm talking like, you know, out of garages, out of, you know, uh, workshops in the back, really cool bootstrap stuff. So you're getting some cool stuff in these boxes. And right now, if you go over and use code tackle talk. 30 tackle talk 30 at checkout you're going to save 30 percent off your first month's box just for listening to the show for supporting what we do go check them out www.darkhorsetackle.com use code tackle talk 30 tackle talk 30 at checkout and get some cool baits each and every month and try something out discover some new companies that you may or may not have heard of so go follow them on instagram facebook at dark horse tackle or again www.darkhorsetackle.com all right, let's get back to our conversation with Matt Pangrak. You mentioned something about being little, and this could be completely wrong, but I, I swear to goodness I read an article at one point. Did you, was this you or was this somebody else, that won some, like, something at the classic, like some casting thing as a real yeah. young kid? Was that yeah, you? Yeah, that's how I got into this. Really? Yeah, I was a Bassmaster Casting Kids National Champion in 1998. How Denny did that, Brower, how, did, how did you Lake. how did you get into that? Was it just something like your parents said, "Hey, yeah, you no, try I always this liked thing? to fish." And then we went down to the Civic Center for the fishing expo, and the local bass club had the casting contest, and I won it. The local, like it's just a Zebco to a Target, and then <clears throat> didn't know anything about it. And they're like, "Hey, you go to the next level, which was state." So I got like, I did really well at state, but not enough to go to regional. So the next year, I was like, I want to go to the Bassmaster Classic because I knew what it was just because I followed fishing. So I went down, we lived like two blocks from a holiday inn that had an atrium and I like talked to the manager. I'm 12 years old and I was like, Hey, I have this casting competition for fishing. Can I bring a target into your atrium at night? Cause it was just empty and practice my casting. And he was like, okay. So I had the target, like my dad put it on this thing that folded. So it'd have the whole, the actual target. And then we got the, and I would go like two hours a night for like every single night until the competition, probably like six months, like every single night. And I would practice my flipping, pitching and casting. And then I Holy went cow. and won the state the or the regional, the state, the regional, and then went to the Bassmaster Classic and won that. So it was like five grand and you got to hang out with all the guys and stuff. So. Man, someday when they come out with the the Matt Pangrak documentary, just the you in the atrium of a hotel casting yeah, with the Rocky music on in the that background come at two a.m. Like, <laughs> run out of content. <laughs> That'll never happen. But yeah, that's Dude, so that's kind of how I got into it. Cool. That was like my introduction to like tournament fishing. So then the club that I originally qualified with was the Assumption Bass Club. And they're just a bunch of like just grumpy old men, just like really nice dudes though. And they're like, Hey, you want to fish with us? So then they let me fish with them when I was like 13, 14, 15, even though I wasn't old enough to like be, you have to be 16. So I fished with them all the way through eight till I was 18. And that's how I got into tournament fishing was that casting kids. And then a couple of those guys from the club were like, Hey, do you want to join our club? That's so, cool. Yep. Man. So then, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you too, so this is a question I specifically want to ask you because you're right in the middle of the industry where I know if I ask this question to uh, an older crowd that I'm going to get one answer. And if I ask this question to a younger crowd, I get a different answer. So I feel like you're kind of right there in the middle. And it's just, it's it's a little bit bigger question about the industry in general, because I want to see where you think that all of this is going like as a whole in the next 10 to 20 years, because you're seeing two very different colliding worlds. You're seeing, you know, the on one hand, I guess this past year or two years, three years, whatever, you've had tremendous growth in in fishing. I mean, you had obviously the pandemic, you had people out fishing, you've had social media and YouTube and everything like that just kind of skyrocket the past couple of years. But then on the flip side, you see, you know, and, and I don't want to say that the tournament side of things has has not done well because they're still doing really well. You Mm -hmm. had, you know, the Fox deal you had, um, you have now two major tournament circuits as opposed to one. So you're seeing some stuff there, but it just seems to me like the tournament side of things is not growing as fast as the other parts of the industry, especially with younger people. Um, am I way off there or do you think that, that maybe the tournament side, uh, at some, I just feel like they're stuck. I feel like they're right in the middle where mm-hmm. they're not growing as fast as a lot of the other parts of the sport are. Do you think 
there's there's anything to be said for that or in the future? Do you think there's any changes they have to make to kind of appeal to a younger crowd? I, I know what you're saying. And I think both the tournament aspect and the, the social media YouTube aspect are really valuable to the sport of fishing as a whole. What I think you're starting to see at a, a smaller level is the tournament fishing kind of being used as a conduit to solidify and set apart the YouTube and, and social media to where you've got Lunkers TV that's fishing the NPFL and a division of the opens and a division of the Toyotas. And you had Perrick that fished the open. You've got guys like uh, Andrew Nordby with fishing with Nordby who just had a top 10 in the Toyota on uh, Chickamauga, who also has a YouTube presence. Um, you've got favorite fishing um, and, and Guggen uh, who is seeing a value in sponsoring both the high end pros on tour, as well as the social media stuff. You're then seeing high end pros like Ski Reese and Edwin Evers um, and Kevin Van Dam and a bunch of these guys who originally weren't join your Hunter Shryox and your Wheelers and your MDJs and Connells and Polynix in this, the YouTube social media aspect. So while there does seem to be a distinct difference between the two now, I think you're starting to slowly see it blend. You're seeing a lot of YouTube guys that are seeing value in the tournament side and a lot of the tournament guys that are seeing value in the YouTube side. And I mean, dude, this whole thing's about survival, right? Yeah. And if fishing is so volatile that there's very few guys outside of maybe Aaron Martins and Steve Kennedy, you can make a living on earnings alone. You're going to see guys find a way to survive. So when the social media and YouTube and all those guys can't set themselves apart because that market is so saturated and they're setting themselves apart by beginning to fish tournaments and the tournament guys are not able to set aside them apart from all the other tournament guys that are doing the same thing. So then they start going to the YouTube and the social media stuff and boom, there you go. Now you've got guys who are doing it all. So I, I, I think while there is, seems to be a stink line, I think it's way more melded and merged together than people realize right now. Yeah. And I, that's a good point. Do you think at some point though, the, c- cause I guess on the YouTube side, there were a couple people that got in really early and did mm-hmm. it pretty well and, and did very well. And, and you saw them skyrocket. Yep. And now that market is fairly saturated, which is why I think you're seeing a lot of those guys go and they say, Ooh, there's something novel over here in tournament fishing. I can make some content on tournament fishing stuff. And Ooh, that'll, that'll kind of get me through the next year or two. And that'll be cool enough to keep people engaged. Do you think at some point all that gets stale where that, that merge doesn't really, uh, do anybody any justice anymore? And it's like, okay, at some point, people have to want to watch tournament fishing because they're interested in the sport and not because some guy they follow on YouTube is fishing in the Toyota series. I'll tell you where this goes. This will go where the sponsors determine it goes because <laughs> the content will be created based on the revenue it generates. So if there's more a lot of revenue and an avenue for revenue in tournaments because of tournament wins and publicity on TV and legitimacy to the angler because of beating other people on a specific product that generates sales. It'll go to tournament fishing. If it's entertainment, easy to digest. Hey, this is, I like this guy. I trust this guy. He's like a buddy because I watch him every day because he actually has content every day that I can digest and my kids like it. Then that's where the money will go. So I mean, the end result here is who sells more stuff. I mean, that's that's honestly where <laughs> that's honestly where the you know will be the beginning, the end, the mer- the merger of all of it. So then, on the tournament side, my last question there is: Do you th- and I'm not going to do the whole you know let's take a dump on MLF or anything like that, mm-hmm. but do do you think it was a net positive or a net negative to have? another premier circuit come on board and because i think the thing you worry about is like to the casual fishing fan you're spreading those people that are household names pretty thin or in one case they all got paid to go one way Mm -hmm. and now you've kind of got the and the bassmaster uh series obviously will will be fine obviously they're they're showing that very easily but Mm -hmm. you had you know the top 20 25 most recognizable names all 
jump to go to one thing and you're spreading those people pretty thin. Do you think it was a net positive or a net negative to have another big circuit kind of come on board and I guess split the baby a little bit? I still think it's too early to tell. I mean, we're like basically three years into this thing and not a lot has been talked about this, but you have to remember like back in the two thousands, like FLW made a major push at this and you had a lot of anglers that left bass in the top one fifties in the tour and went over to FLW and FLW had programming on ESPN two, And they had all sorts of live stuff. They had cameras that stuck 15 feet out of the boats and guys wearing battery packs and Snickers Jersey and Alpo dog food and Fuji film and all sorts of stuff. Right. And I mean, they were a, a, premier league with tons of payouts and and Forrest was dumping money and Irwin date Jacobs was dumping money on it. You had guys on Wheaties boxes and on end caps and Walmart. I mean, it was a big deal and you had Bassmaster going on at the same time. And then Bassmaster had ESPN outdoor block that ESPN bought Bassmaster from, uh, I believe it was Helen severe and that group. And they were going to turn it into the next NASCAR and G-Man's Garage and Bass Center (laughs) with all these guys. So, I mean, it's not like, oh my gosh, we just had this one organization and now it's getting split. It's always been split. I mean, there were wars and then they worked together and then they got into it apart and they'd schedule on top of each other. So this is the same thing that I feel like is kind of going on with, with MLF and the BPT, albeit this split was definitely for different reasons. Um, And they're trying to change the narrative. I mean, they're completely trying to go after a different crew and you could tell that really early on. And I think their strategy has changed from what they thought it would be um, to to what they are now. I think they've made some mistakes. I think they've done some really good stuff, right? Uh, But the reason they also exist is because Bass has made some mistakes and then Bass has done a lot of good things, right? So, I mean, you get to the point where it's kind of like Ford versus Chevy right? You have your, your favorite brand. And I don't think anyone truly knows where, where it's going to go. I mean, there's drawbacks and and benefits to both of them. The interesting comparison, I guess, to like a Ford versus Chevy thing is that there clearly is enough demand in the United States to have Ford and Chevy. Like, is there, I think, and that's what we have to wait to see, right? Is there enough demand to have the Bass Pro Tour from MLF, the Bassmaster Elite Series event, the Tackle Warehouse Pro Circuit, or whatever you know it's yep. called now, right? Like, <laughs> is there the enough? Is there enough? And- yeah, is there enough demand to have all of these going on at once, or do some of them get cannibalized? And if so, who's first to go? So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you it's had interesting. A, you had eighteen hundred dollars, and they pay the top forty back in the Bassmaster Opens. You had ninety five people just begging to give them their eighteen hundred dollars, spend three grand yeah. a week, and only the top forty just barely make their money back. So yeah. if they're making money just, just off of the lower, you know, if you're winning other people's money, like, yeah, that's always going to be around because they're always going to get their cut. Like it's a right. freaking astronomical cut that some of those organizations oh, yeah. take out of the prize <laughs> fund. You're like, you know, scratching and clawing and you're like, you made like a quarter million dollars this week just for putting this tournament on. Yeah. When just, you just for keeping pay out. 25% of what we pay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. then as far as that, that's a whole nother interesting thing as far as like, which which one is, is is there enough interest and revenue generated from sponsorship of the professional circuits? Okay, so we'll switch gears here. The very last topic I want to cover with you. Obviously, you're in the studio right now. BTL, um, yep. a big part of probably how people know you, how people have got to know you and got to kind of follow your story. We had Jeffries on, I think, like two months ago, um, and we asked him some of these similar questions. So I'm interested to hear uh, your thoughts on them too, because we got Jeffries' side, but. One of the things I told him was I thought from the very beginning when I started listening to you guys, which was I came on pretty late. I probably started listening like two years ago, maybe something like that. Um, So not I wasn't as savvy to it as a lot of other people I know that I listen to. But um, the the one cool thing from the very beginning was like I looked at you, too, and I thought that's going to be a really interesting combo of of co-hosts because you have very different personalities. You have very different uh, demeanors. You have different uh, backgrounds, uh, generational gap there too. So what is it that you think makes you and Jeffrey's such a good duo? Um, that's a good question. I think we kind of under, like understand each other in a way and know that we, we have each other's back, but it's a weird relationship that we have, dude. It's like a, it's like a coworker boss and 
employee, brother, friend, father, son relationship all kind of mixed into one, if that doesn't sound too weird. Um, (laughs) And we all like play the other roles on it. But I think we both have a passion for the sport and a passion to do quality work. And we both have a little bit of a chip on our shoulder and that makes it work. I hope he's probably going to listen to it. I feel like at times I can be a little bit more rational, which really works when you're with someone like, cause Jeffries can have like a hot, you know, a hot headed temper. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then, so like I kind of even that out. And then at times I can be a little timid or complacent and, and his kind of go get it achievement, you know, get over yourself attitude, like really benefits me. Um, and so I think we just like complement each other really well. And I think it works in that show because we don't always agree. And it's sometimes genuine disagreements and discussions, just like you have. I mean, dude, I was in a bass club. I've seen guys F you, F you, I quit and drive off with their boats and stuff like that's real life. People get in arguments and, you know, that's over whether the, the off, you know, out of limits boundary was 10 feet to the right or 10 feet to the left, right? <laughs> you know, of the ramp. So I think that there's like a, re- a, 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 a realism in it that, uh, that really conveys like a lot of our off camera discussions and stuff are like the same ones we have on camera. Um, and you know, sometimes we'll get into it, start and we'll be like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. I don't know where you're going with this. You don't know where I'm going with this. Let's just do this on the show. And then you can tell that it's genuine. It's not like planned out or anything. And that's so, what he was saying too. He kind of blew my mind when he said, you guys basically don't do any pre-show prep, like no yeah, pre-show no. meeting, like crazy, anything like that. Cause again, I'm a, I'm a prep guy. Like I have yeah. to have my stuff ready to go. And at least, at least, a I don't know, maybe an outline or at least know kind of where my thoughts are going to go or else I get too jumbled mm-hmm. and they just go out the window. But was that hard for you to get used to at the beginning? Cause I feel like when you, you sign up to say, Hey, we're going to do a bass fishing talk show. No, it's like, okay, it cool. We'll have some structure. Materialized. It didn't ever really, there wasn't ever really a plan, at least from my part. Now, I mean, Jeffries has a business degree and work for UPS and wore the slacks and the tie and, and stuff. So he knows how that works. I'm a communications degree. I mean, I slid lumber in the off season in between college. And then my junior year, Jeffries was like, Hey, you can go full time with me after. So like I have a real skewed sense of reality. And I mean, I'm not saying that like as a good or bad thing, but like, this is all I know. Right. Yeah. So I'm seeing it from like a real different perspective than a guy who put in 25 years at UPS with a 401k and health benefits and plans and insurance and a family and a homeowner and all that stuff. So, I mean, he, he might has a pl- have a plan, but I just like roll with it. Cause my theory is like, man, I'm doing what I love. I love what I'm doing. And yeah, I mean, I, I do things smart. It's it, save and do things the right way. Try to, I mean, it's not like I'm just like free rolling out here. I mean, I've made <laughs> plans, but just as far as life experiences like that, he's got a lot more organization and planning than I do. And I think he had kind of a vision for how it would. I was just along like, cool i'm in the industry for the first couple years and then it started to evolve is there ever any any point where you're like man i wish this wasn't live you know what i don't even know if i should answer that question because that's like when the co-angler gets on the boat and i say you had any problems with your motor (laughs) and you're like dude i'm not answering because if sure if you're like no that thing's bulletproof halfway down the lake boom it, it pops but Uh, no, I like the live element because you're forced to make a reaction. There is no, you can't like stop and, and redo it. But I mean, I'm sure that day's cut. Yeah. There's been some stuff that I've regretted saying. There's been some stuff that Jeffries has regretted saying, but, but as a whole, I think the live makes it, makes it cool. Yeah. Cause me sitting here, like, again, this isn't going up right now. I'll, I'll have time Mm -hmm. to, if I say something stupid, you know, I could go back and edit it. I have that luxury that you don't. So again, my hat's off to you guys, because not only do you do it, you do it every day with no show prep. Like that kind of blows my mind. It's just, there is a lot of show prep as far as that, but like what we're going to talk about and stuff like that. Yeah. There's more content wise. I'm like, Hey, you're going to talk about this and then I'm going to say this and you're going to say this. That doesn't happen with you guys. No, no, I I don't think, uh, I mean, Man, yeah, you would have to have like a producer, and like Jeffries yeah. is the producer <laughs> and the co-host, <laughs> and he runs it. Like he does, he's incredible at his ability to multitask, and that's what people don't realize is he's able to banner with me, 
book the guests, do the music, run the show, do the instant feedback, troubleshoot, do everything on time without missing a beat. And he's no BS. He's doing the job of three or four people. Yeah. And he's holding a conversation while just all of us in the chat are going, here. the audio's low, the audio's low, the audio's exactly. low. <laughs> and I'm just over here sitting, I mean, you know, bantering back and forth with him. And what you guys can't see is him. He's, he's doing a million different things, but that's how yeah. he's always been with everything. Like it's not a hundred percent like by the book, like how you're supposed to do it, but he figures out a way to get it done. He figures out a way that it works for him and he rolls with it. And that's like a cool life lesson that I've learned from him outside of, you know, the studio and things like that is man, figure out what works for you, find a way to get it to work and just freaking go, 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 go and just do it. Yeah. And I think that's, You've hit it a couple times, but just you guys have a, a really good kind of yin and yang thing going there where it's like, mm-hmm. okay, you have two things that are polar opposites. You have Jeffrey, who's a little bit more assertive, uh, I would say. Jeffrey's is a little bit more assertive on his his uh, points. And like you said, you can go off on some tangents. And that's what you love about him, right? He's really passionate about something and he just goes for it. And then you're kind of there as the more uh, level-headed, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, quiet, Delusional. reserved. but. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it, it ends up working out really well, and then obviously it leads to some cool conversations with your guests, and you guys do have some insane guests over the past, I don't know, however long you've been there. Who was your favorite person that you've got the chance to talk to? Man, the guy who busted uh, Mike Long, Kelly That was Ellis. the coolest episode I've ever seen. <laughs> that was like surreal. I've probably watched that 10 times. <laughs> that was freaking surreal because we were just trying to get him on. But he like came. Uh, we, I haven't talked to him since. And he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it in person. He's like, I'm moving somewhere else. I'm coming up. He like drove up. He had like a replica of like the world record and stuff. Yeah. And he's just like, man, here's how it went down. Wild. The, the amount of time he invested to get what he got on camera on camera. Yeah, I've, I like I said, I probably watched that episode 10 times of just because it's it's so surreal because you always you heard about uh mike long's name a ton and then all of a sudden it just kind of dropped off and again i'm over here in central ohio like we're not real (laughs) hip to everything that was going on over there and i was like oh this is the whole story this is crazy that was a wild one obviously anything with aaron and steve aaron martins or steve kennedy are really really good ones just the guys who look at things from a unique perspective i love interviewing greg hackney um greg hackney is a good interview regardless greg hackney can make the world's worst interviewer look like a freaking genius just the way he talks and stuff like he's such a good such a good interview uh, and really easy to interview and uh i like some of the ones that jeffrey's books that you're like why are we having this person on this person doesn't have like anything to do with bass fishing or they're not like i mean like he has a really good ear and a really good eye for getting interviews that people go oh i remember that dude or how does this relate and then by the end you're like we gotta get this like okay so we do day four with frank scalish now right and we yep. had frank on and it was like a where are they now de- deal and it was like hey frank you know lake erie specialist central ohio i knew him i didn't know him that well like i mean if he passed me a couple years ago he might be like oh you're the kid who worked with jeffries back in the day but then he was like oh we're gonna have frank on again and i'm like okay and he's like, oh, we're going to have Frank on again. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then it was like the day four. And now it like makes total sense. It seems totally natural to have Frank on day four. And like, he's kind of like giving Frank a resurgence as far as his like mainstream popularity. A lot of people don't realize he works his ass off behind the scenes and like does a lot with, with Pradco and the paint shop. And I yeah. mean, he's revered in, you know, him in Ohio yep. and that part of the, yes, <laughs> but you know, nationwide, it wasn't like that. And that's like Jeffrey's bring it back. The same reason why Harold Allen is in the hall of fame as the legend. I mean, in 2006, Harold retired, wasn't going to fish the elite series anymore. And Mark was like, Hey, we're sponsored by Skeeter. Let's bring Harold on. Let's give him the nickname, the legend and make him the analyst. I mean, yeah. he was just a old school dude from Toledo Bend who had five top tens in classics and was just the consummate pro. And then Mark turned him into the legend. So he yeah. has an eye for doing that. And I told Jeffrey is when we talked to him too, I said, I'm not kidding. I bet if you guys would have had day four when I first started this show, like I mm-hmm. wouldn't have started the show because that was what I was looking for. Basically, I was just looking for like, you know, tips, tricks, actual info that I could digest and then go out on the water and be like, OK, I'm going to apply this. And it's hard to find that. You you don't find a ton of 
information heavy unless you want to go to Bass U or something like that of just, okay, sit down and, you know, there's not a whole lot of frill or fluff or anything like that. Here's some info you can use on the water and it fits up perfectly with you guys. Three days of kind of your, your fun banter back and forth and your interviews and your good shows and then you send everybody basically into the weekend with the information they learn from Frank and then, okay, go out fish for two, three days, come back, we'll, <laughs> we'll reconvene on Monday and we'll start this over again. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a cool thing. I mean, Mark's been doing it for over 20 years and 17 with BTL. So, I mean, he's a one of a kind in the industry. I I don't, I don't think he gets a lot of the kind of accolades that he deserves. Agreed. And I thought it was cool to hear his story too about, you know, the, the old, what is it? Sirius XM days and stuff like that. And how Mm -hmm. long he's been grinding this thing. when When he's talking about going out and being like, you know, one of the first, uh, I guess beat reporters for that kind of stuff and showing up with like the, you know, the laptop that doesn't even have a backlight and having, he to, wasn't you know, kidding hide it under the sun. He yeah, wasn't and, kidding. Like, we literally had a, literally had a cardboard box and a tough book, like the kind that the cops use, like on cops, the TV show, the reruns that long ago. Like that's what it was in a fire wire cable cable and a flip cannon camera that was duct taped to a tripod. And then you run it through and you have to like render it. And then he's somewhere and he would bring like two PCs, like PCs, not like laptops, like with the big box, like, like Bill Gates, 1979 <laughs> stuff. And it all hook up and then boom, we'd be live. Isn't it freaking weird? You can do all of that on a phone now. Yeah. I know <laughs> your iPhone in your pocket does everything that you needed. Uh, probably $10,000 and three trucks to haul to every lake. It was freaking cool though. On the flip side of guests, is there anybody that's still on your bucket list that you haven't got to talk to yet that you're like, Mark, can you like try and book this person? I would really love a chance to talk to them. Um, so we do a lot of sports comparisons with other sports, right? Yeah. And I would love to get Justin Lucas's brother on. He's like played in like the U S open. He's on the minor leagues for golf. He's like a full-time golfer. That's what he does. And he's played in a bunch of PGA tour stuff. But like, I think that would be a really cool interview to talk about him grinding and making it, trying to make it as a full-time PGA tour pro and the comparison of the guys trying to do it in fishing. I think that would be a cool one. Um, other than that, it's just the cool thing is like whoever pops up, I mean, unless they're like in the other stratosphere, like Mark will just go after him or I'll try yeah. to try to get him. So we've had some really cool stuff. I'd love to have more psychology and stuff like that, like mental yeah. mind stuff from someone who knows nothing about fishing. Yeah. Like just, and then relate, go back and relate it to fishing. That's cool. Cause those are the yeah. ones that are interesting. Those are the off the wall stuff where you Weird listen, you're like, I remember sport. that. Yeah. Like this is if you're listening to your podcast or my Bass Talk Live or any of that, if you're watching Bass Masters online or the BPT online, it seems totally normal, right? You're a bass fishing geek. That's what you do. But like if you're watching the qualifying rounds for a bowling deal online, you're like, that guy's a bowling nerd. And like what you're doing is you don't even realize how far down the wormhole you are when you've gotten to this level because it's what you're into. But now apply it to like NASCAR or bowling or darts, billiards, uh, cornhole, any of that. And that all exists in all those other worlds. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I like to try to bring it back and like put it into perspective of like normal everyday life. And See, that's what I love about the internet, though, is like when we're in our big nerd circles, like my nerd circle feels bigger now that there's a whole internet culture where it's like, hey, I can watch yeah. your show. There's a couple other, you know, uh, nerds that are just like me that, you know, and then there's thousands of people listening to you, too. It's like, OK, I'm not in this alone. Like same thing with I guess if you do have a affinity for darts or something, right? There's yeah. some community online. It's like, OK, I'm not as weird have as you ever I think. That? There's, have no. you ever watched the darts over in England? No. Oh, dude, you got to do that. You got to you got to YouTube that later. England, There's like England darts. Uh, uh, yeah, just the professional darts. It's crazy. So it's like 10,000 drunk people all packed into this freaking room and they're standing there and they do it. And there's like this guy with this voice and he's like 60 points and the people go nuts. And then like a perfect score is 180. And he's like, you know, like Mercer does giant bass. He'll go yeah. 180 and like people go nuts, lose their mind over it. 
Oh my god. I'm like, watching look it right up now. most epic oh dark matches. My... <laughs> you didn't know this There's existed? There's so many people here. There's oh, so many dude, people it's there. It's freaking crazy. You didn't know this existed? <laughs> no. No. This is like a uh, uh, like a concert. But there, yeah, at the very front of the stage, like there's just a giant dartboard that yeah, no one in the a, crowd can see. There's a Kevin Van Dam of darts. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm watching full match of Michael Van Gerwen versus Peter Wright, 2019 2020 Darts World Championship. Yeah. And they are just in the zone. One guy has purple hair, like a purple mohawk. Oh my goodness. And the crowd's literally just, yeah, they just announce what it is and the crowd goes wild. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah, like that exists. So there's yeah. a community of that for everything. So oh, you're yeah. right. I love that. I love there's that we've just got a chance to nerd out with ours. There's people out there that don't even know that professional bass fishing is a thing and think that the world revolves around darts. Wild. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to fall down a wormhole here in about 10 minutes. I'm going to watch oh, dude, it's a good <laughs> dart Champions. You know, the other one that I've gotten into is uh, urban climbing. You got to look up Mustang Wanted. He's a dude out of like the Ukraine. Urban climbing. Yeah, just look up Mustang Wanted. Mustang Wanted. Oh, there's a billion videos. How is this dude still alive? i just looking at the thumbnails yeah. and I, so I already. There's, oh no. there's all sorts of He's documentaries like cell and towers stuff on and stuff. that. So he was, he like snuck into Russia and like spray painted all seven of the squires of those big stars on top of the stuff there. He's like banned from Russia now. <laughs> there's oh like videos, goodness. but there's a whole underground thing of urban climbing, just like there is a billiards, just like there is a fishing. So you just like walk around and climb water towers yeah. and stuff. Yeah. hundred percent. And, uh, Oh my goodness. Yeah. That, what that else? was that. Yeah. Now my like free. Wondering. Yeah. What so that, that got me into free climbing with Alex Honnold oh, and man. free solo. Like you want Would to talk ever- about like getting into your mind. No, I'm scared to be more than six <laughs> feet off the ground. Maybe that's why it intrigues me. You know, what's weird. I have uh, it's called like animal phobia or something crazy. I don't have a fear of heights looking down. I have a fear of being under something tall looking up at it. I can't do it. I can't stand like under a tower and look up at it, but I'd be fine if I was up on the tower looking down. Really? And I don't know what I'm and there's no rational fear for it. I'm not scared like that thing's going to fall over on me or anything. I just like immediately like want to throw up if I look up at something that's like really tall. How far do you have right to get away it. from it then? Oh, probably like, I don't know, like if it's a skyscraper or like not sky, around here, mm-hmm. a skyscraper. So like, <laughs> you know, a, a 12 story building or something. Um, I probably have to get a couple blocks away before I feel OK looking at it. Oh, a couple blocks. Yeah. Oh, wow. I don't like looking up at tall. Yeah, that's interesting. No. Very weird. Yeah. But again, oh. I can probably go online after this and find a whole community of people <laughs> that uh, are scared yeah. at looking at tall things. You do what makes yeah. you happy, man. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, so before we let you go, one last question. Uh, more of a deeper question here, too. So in 10 years, you're looking back. Where is Matt Pangrak in a perfect world 10 years from now? I mean, I feel like I'll be happy regardless of where I am. But ideally, I want to be fishing at the professional level, whatever the heck that looks like in 10 years, who knows? But I also want to merge the BTO platform, podcast, talk, interaction with the viewers into it to where it's a 50-50 deal. Um, Multiple revenue streams. And dude, like the feedback that I've gotten from the BTL listeners about fishing the opens, like there's a lot of guys fishing the opens. I'm not doing anything special. I'm not like ripping the world apart. I'm not like super impressive with what I'm doing. I'm just out there like doing the best that I can. And it relates to people. Some people like I'm sure it, it obviously relates to because the messages and stuff that I get about it and the guys who are like, Hey man, we're rooting for you. And I mean, in all honesty, like it's no bearing on anyone's life, whether I finish 10th or 40th, but like if they're invested in me, like I want to keep that connection alive and kind of meld the, the fishing Avenue and the media podcast Avenue and kind of have a big hybrid deal going. And everyone's like, well, you can't focus on one. You can't focus on the other. Why not? Why can't I do both? Watch me. (laughs) Yeah. That's the, that's the game plan. Yep. Well, that's cool. Well, I'd say we've kept you too long here. We'll let you no, go. But good. before uh, before you go, do you want to let people know where they can keep up with you guys, both, I guess, BTL and you personally? Yeah, it's just uh, BassZone.com uh, and BTL. 
uh, Bass Talk Live on uh, YouTube. We we uh, we do the shows typically Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at eight thirty a.m. Unless Mark changes it, and then you can go to BassZone.com and and find it. Uh, day four with Frank at eight thirty in the morning. All the replays are out on uh, the Bass Talk Live YouTube. I also film all of my Bassmaster Opens uh, and put them out on YouTube. So I just dropped uh, day two of Pickwick, where I decided to. Uh, leave Pickwick and fish for spotted bass in April, which was a horrible life decision, but I almost made it work. <laughs> uh, so a bunch of content out over there. And then, man, I'm not a big, big Facebook guy. So I just do uh, Instagram primarily, which is just my name, Matt Pangrak. Uh, so if I get a lot of people who shoot me messages and stuff on that, which is really cool. So that's about it. Awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is our conversation with Mr. Matt Pangrak. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is our conversation with Matt Pangrak. Matt, thanks for stopping by. Always fun to have kind of these more laid back conversations with some folks. And, you know, we uh, we dove off the deep end on a couple topics, which is a whole lot of fun, too. So thanks for stopping by. I know he's a busy dude, especially with the tournament schedule this year and everything that's going on. And thank you for listening. Each and every one of you listening makes this show possible. I love hearing from you guys. Uh, it's so much fun to see kind of the numbers and stuff rise every week. You guys are incredible. And if you want to talk, if you got any questions, if you just want to kind of shoot the bull and talk fishing, at Hayes Fishing, H A Z E Fishing on Instagram or at Tackle Talk Podcast on Instagram or Facebook. Find us on the web, www.tackletalkpodcast.com. Leave us a review if you can. That helps a ton. That's probably one of the nicest things you can do. It helps us be found in kind of the uh, the searches a little bit easier and stuff like that. So if you like the episode or you like this show, a five-star review would be awesome. Um, but that helps a ton. Again, shoot me a message if you want to talk, and I will see you next Tuesday for another brand new episode of Tackle Talk. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2021. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.